little sun. Some for me, some for everyone. A little bit of love. A little bit of love.
talking about love That's a strong word most don't speak of You can find it in your soul and your heart in the fashion You can find it in places you will never imagine You can find it in a friend or in a lover You know love will let loose if it's uncovered You can find it in your family always around They'll always be there to help you out See I love this planet and its people And in God's eyes we are equal So let's live it like they live it in the world above The things we could do with a little bit of love
As you may know, my close ties with Canada go back almost four decades to the time when many thousands of Asian refugees from Uganda, including many Ismailis, were welcomed so generously in this society. These ties have continued through the cooperation of our Aga Khan Development Network with several Canadian institutions, including the establishment four years ago of the Global Centre for Pluralism in Ottawa. I had the opportunity last week to chair a highly productive meeting there of the Centre's Board of Directors. Earlier this year, we celebrated here in Toronto the foundation ceremony for the Arkan Museum and a new Ismaili Centre. So there are powerful chords of memory from four decades ago, four years ago, and even four months ago that tie me closely to Canada. I was also deeply moved by Canada's extraordinary gift to me of honorary citizenship. I always have felt at home when I come to Canada, but never more so than in the wake of this honor. And if I ever felt any trepidation about accepting this invitation, it has been significantly reduced by the fact that I can now claim, however modestly, to be a Canadian. Thank you. Many thanks go to all of you who are attending this lecture or are watching and listening from elsewhere. It is a busy autumn, I know. For one thing, I believe the undefeated Maple Leafs are playing on television at this very hour. <laughs> My friends, my Canadian friends like to tell me about a time when the Stanley Cup playoffs were in full swing and a gentleman took his seat in the front row of the stadium, leaving a seat open next to him. His neighbor asked why such an excellent seat for such an important event was unclaimed. And the man explained that his wife normally sat there, but that she'd passed away. The neighbor expressed his sympathies, but asked whether a member of the family or another relative or friend might have been able to use the ticket. No, the man replied, they're all at the funeral. The subject of tonight's lecture may not have quite the emotional hold of the Stanley Cup, but for me, it has been a matter of immense importance. On the Iberian Peninsula, between the 8th and the 16th centuries, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish cultures interacted creatively in what was known as Al-Andalus. Remarkably, it lasted for most of seven centuries, a longer period than the time that has since passed. The fading of Al-Andalus came as a new spirit of nationalism rose in Europe, propelled by what scholars have called a sense of imagined community. Where local and tribal loyalties once dominated, national identifications came to flourish. As we know, these nationalist rivalries eventually exploded into world war. The post-war emergence of the European Union has been a response to that history, much as regional groupings from Southeast Asia to Central Asia, from Latin America to Eastern Africa, have been testing the potential for pan-national cooperation. This brings me to the story of Canada, shaped so fundamentally 
by two European cultures. This dual inheritance was an apparent weakness at one point, but it was transformed into an enormous strength, thanks to leaders like La Fontaine and Baldwin, as well as those who shaped the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982, and so many others who contribute, contributed to a long, incremental process. That process has been extended over time to include a broader array of peoples, the First Peoples and the Inuits, and a host of new immigrant groups. I am impressed by the fact that some 44% of Canadians today are of neither French nor British descent. I am told, in fact, that a typical Canadian citizenship ceremony might now include people from two dozen different countries. To be sure, the vision I am describing is sometimes questioned and still incomplete, as I know Canadians insist on acknowledging. But it is nonetheless an asset of enormous global value. Welcome and bienvenue. Welcome to Friday Night Reflections. I'm Arif Farani, the Member of Parliament for Parkdale High Park and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. And I wanted to extend a very warm welcome to Jamaati members, to multi-faith family members, and to everyone else watching from across Canada and indeed from around the world. I hope that you enjoyed your week and you've been staying safe. With the school year concluding and all of this heat descending upon all of us here in Canada, especially in the western half of the country, there is no question that summer has definitely arrived. Of course, one indicator that summer is here is Canada Day, which we are commemorating today. Generally, this is a time of barbecues and fireworks, but this year's anniversary of Canadian Confederation is more solemn and it requires more reflection. The recent unearthing of almost 1,000 unmarked graves of Indigenous children at Indian residential institutions in British Columbia and in Saskatchewan has challenged all of us. It compels us to reflect honestly on how Canada was built in modern times, to learn more about the Indigenous experience on this land, and to commit to transparency and accountability and justice as we all work on reconciliation together. I think we must also reflect on deepening fissures in our society that the pandemic has exposed, whether that is anti-Black racism, anti-Asian sentiment fueled by COVID-19 stigma, and most recently and most horrifically, the hate-driven murders of fellow Muslims in London, Ontario, in an Islamophobic act of rage. What do these events tell us about the state of multiculturalism, diversity and pluralism in Canada in 2021? How should we feel about our country, the country that Moulana Hazri Imam has asked us to make our home? I think the starting point for this discussion was provided recently, right here on Friday Night Reflections, by the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson. When she was here, she reminded us that being part of Canada is not like attending some sort of buffet and taking what you choose, but rather, she said, it's more analogous to a fixed menu, and that as Canadians, all of the history that we have lived through is our collective responsibility, a joint obligation where we all have to acknowledge the wrongdoings of the past and present and get to work on helping to heal together. And tonight, that is how we will commemorate this occasion, by hearing about some of the members of our Jamaat, people who have given to our country to make it better in really remarkable ways. I personally am very proud to be able to host this episode of Friday Night Reflections. Of course, working to make the country better is something that I've aspired to in my career and the better part of my adulthood. Like many of you watching today, I arrived in Canada with my family as a refugee from Uganda. At the time when I arrived, I was a tender baby of 10 months old. My family first found support at the Stanley Street YMCA in Montreal in 1972. We later established ourselves in Toronto, where my parents, like many immigrant families, struggled with establishing a home while navigating the multiple challenges that life in a strange and much colder country presented. But we took advantages of the opportunities that we were presented with. After completing my undergraduate studies at McGill, with the help of an Aga Khan Foundation scholarship, and my law degree at the University of Toronto, I began working as a constitutional litigator, advocating on issues of human rights and access to justice. I had the privilege of working as an analyst with the Canadian Human Rights Commission in Ottawa, as an investigator avec la Commission des droits de la personne et des droits de la jeunesse in Montreal, and as an assistant trial attorney 
working with the UN prosecuting genocide at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which took me back to East Africa. I was also very proud to be an active member of my broader community, supporting various civil society organizations involved in things like access to justice and legal aid services for members of the South Asian community, things like shelters for abused women, entities that worked on food security and addressing mental health stigma. I then made a decision to enter politics, and I've had the honor of being the Member of Parliament for Park Dalai Park since 2015. The shift into the political realm was not an easy decision for me, my wife, or my children. However, I wanted to be able to influence policy and help to bring about positive change through the levers of government, and I have not looked back since. It has been my deepest privilege to have been given several roles by the Prime Minister since 2015. I first served as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration shortly after my first election, given the opportunity to work directly on the resettlement of a new wave of refugees, in this case Syrians, who were coming to this country in 2016. Next, I was asked to serve as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Heritage, focusing both on Indigenous language protection and reconciliation, as well as on increasing funding and supports for multiculturalism in Canada. Most recently, the Prime, the Prime Minister appointed me as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Here, I've been working on helping to tackle issues like the proliferation of online hatred. Today, as we reflect on this point in the history of Canada, on what we stand for and what we can become and how we can all contribute, we remember the words of Moulana Hazriman when speaking about building peaceful, pluralist societies. He reminded us, and I quote, Developing support for pluralism does not occur naturally in human society. It is a concept which must be nurtured every day in every forum, in large and small government and private institutions, in civil society organizations working in the arts, culture and public affairs and in the media, in the law and in justice, particularly in terms of social justice, such as health, social safety nets and education, and in economic justice, such as employment opportunities and access to financial services. So tonight I say to you, let us embark on a Canadian journey to building and strengthening our pluralist society. What we will do is we will commence this evening with stories from Jamaati members who serve Canada in truly remarkable ways. We will then move to reflect on Canadian citizenship ceremonies, which I know many of our viewers, including me, have participated in directly. And we will conclude, as always, with musical expressions. Without further ado, let us hear from some Jamaati members who are dedicating their services to this country. My name is Neelam Jetta. I work for the Ministry of Culture, Multiculturalism and Status of Women in Alberta. And I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Status of Women and, and uh, Strategic Integration. So really, um, I've been in government for 29 years now, and it's been service for 29 years. Um, so once I got into the policy work, where it was actually creating policies and in 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 serving the people, in making sure they were healthy, they had uh, you know income security, uh, looking after the most vulnerable in our, in our population, then you felt a sense of uh, of satisfaction that you were doing something that was meaningful. You actually got to see the difference you made in, in, our, in, in the way Albertans live. I am a justice on the Court of Queen's Bench for the province of Saskatchewan. Um, and in Saskatchewan, and every province is a little different, but in Saskatchewan, we have different levels of court, just like they do in other provinces. In our province, we have a provincial level of court. Then we have the Court of Queen's Bench, which is the court on which I sit. Then we have the Court of Appeal. And then, of course, there is the Supreme Court of Canada. Every court has a slightly different role. Um, uh, for example, the provincial court, they will hear a lot more in terms of volume, but they won't necessarily hear the same types of cases. For example, they will not hear cases that involve juries. They will not hear murder type cases. Our level of court will hear those types of cases along with decisions involving family law matters, uh, civil litigation matters, and appeals from things like arbitrations, certain panels, and certain decisions of the provincial court. My role um, at Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada is Assistant Deputy Minister for Transformation, Digital Strategy and Chief Information Officer. What does that mean? 
That means that right now with Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, um, we, are, we are 95% paper-based. Our processes are cumbersome, they're complex. Um, and so, and they've been there for years, for many, many years. And, and with technology that's changing with the number of immigrants that are coming to Canada, my job as the Chief Information Officer and, and, and in charge of digital strategy and transformation is to leverage technology so that we can move away from paper and make it easier for people who want to come to Canada and to remove the backlog. Um, so that is what an Assistant Deputy Minister does. Um, and I have a very, very large department and uh, I run, um, have the mandate to, uh, to move these files forward. I'm uh, an aerospace engineer uh, by trade. That's how I, how I joined the Canadian Armed Forces. So that was uh, over 23 years ago now. Uh, the Lieutenant Colonel uh, job really, or the rank of Lieutenant Colonel is a senior officer rank. And uh, typically, uh, you know, you make it through the ranks and you do different jobs uh, throughout your career uh, as you transition. But the common theme usually is uh, is uh, following your trade. Uh, so mine is an aerospace engineer, so I'm in the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force, and uh, I work uh, with aircraft maintenance uh, in many different facets of, uh, of maintenance, uh, whether it be, um, uh, you know, it's just recently I came from, uh, uh, returned from uh, Warner Robins, Georgia, and I was a senior design engineer for the uh, CC-177 Globemaster, which is our strategic airlift uh, aircraft. So, uh, you know, that's what I did for three years down in, uh, in Warner Robins, working collaboratively with the uh, US Air Force and some of our allies. Uh, I'm about to just go in, uh, in a couple of weeks here, I'll be taking command of uh, 14 Air Maintenance Squadron, uh, which is a unit that supports uh, the uh, CP-140 uh, aircraft, our maritime patrol aircraft here on the, in Greenwood, Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, basically look after the periodic inspection for this aircraft and uh, look after uh, all the components uh, uh, that uh, would be maintained uh, at the second line maintenance. So kind of give you an example uh, of uh, a myriad of different jobs uh, within, uh, within that particular trait. Uh, to give you uh, some some examples of uh, the type of work, uh, certainly as a lieutenant colonel or you know even in the military you're, you're you know an officer first. Uh, so I've done out of trade jobs they call them. Uh, so certainly I uh, have uh, been uh, an executive assistant for uh, for the wing commander at 19 Wing in Comox on the west coast, uh, and I've been a military observer uh, in in the Sudan. Uh, I've also been an advisor to, uh, to the head of academics uh, at uh, Pontoon, Hawaii, which is uh, the, um, uh, the Kabul uh, Air University, uh, looking after the, uh, the Af Afghanistan's uh, Air Force and producing uh, uh, technicians and air crew uh, to sustain their Air Force. So I was an advisor there for nine months uh, with, uh, uh, with the university. So. It's a myriad of different jobs, uh, and that's what's really interesting about it uh, in, uh, in serving uh, in this capacity, is really uh, you uh, get a, a breadth of experience in different uh, types of jobs throughout your career, uh, and certainly uh, that is accompanied by uh, many moves uh, as well. Uh, this will be my 14th move in the Canadian Armed Forces, and I've been in 23 years, so. Assistant Deputy Minister um, means that you are your Deputy Minister's right hand. And when your Deputy Minister is away, you're acting Deputy Minister and uh, connecting with the Minister directly. And even as Assistant Deputy Minister, we are always presenting to the Minister on the best possible solutions. So we are very evidence-based and um, we present to our minister to say, here's what we think. And now more and more often, we are doing more cross-ministry initiatives. So we're presenting to more than one minister to get our point across and uh, in a very uh, non-biased manner, because we are not politicians as government employees. We are public servants and making sure that we are putting forward the best possible solutions for Albertans or Canadians. And then, it's, then it becomes a polit political decision 
on what the what the minister or the government wants to do with the with the information we provided, the briefings we provided them, right? Well, I had a lot of help from a lot of different people. Um, we never get to where we are on our own, and in my case, uh, I had the support of of my parents. I also had the support of colleagues, and I had support of members of the judiciary. I had gotten almost 20 years of experience as a practicing civil litigator, um, and I felt that I could make a bigger difference and a bigger impact on the world around me as a member of the court. And so I made the decision to apply. Uh, you know, right now we have one system, and the one system that we have um, is, is it services the entire immigration continuum. So it doesn't just service the Immigration and Refugees and Citizenship Canada Department and not just um, for processing. It is a system where, um, you know, Global Affairs Canada, Canada Border Services, Immigration and Refugee Board, um, uh, Employment and Social Devo uh, Development Canada, all of these departments use our system in the processing of, um, of different files. And our clients also um, use that, that system. It's legacy, it was built um, before the VHS, I think it was 8-track technology that was around. It was built in that time. And so what we're trying to do now is, you know, as we try to digitize and turn and move away from paper, what we're finding is that um, we're unable to, 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 to move the, the, the um, target of, of, of moving away from paper because the legacy technology, it just can't keep up. It's not able to, we can't connect the cloud to the technology. So what we have to do is um, reduce reduce the amount of cumbersomeness in the, in the current legacy technology, while at the same time in parallel, we're building um, a brand new platform that will allow us to, um, to, to not only digitize, but to be able to do predictive analytics, uh, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, advanced analytics. Um, and it will also allow uh, us to be able to leverage the data that we have um, to, for, for uh, in service of the people who want to come. So they only enter their data once. My passion is aviation. That, uh, that is uh, what uh, I always wanted to do. Uh, you know, I remember, uh, I always tell this story, I remember uh, growing up in Iringa on Jamath Jamas Street uh, in front of my uh, dad and mom's shop, the family shop, a hardware store that they had there. Uh, and uh, you know, every now and then you'd see a, a plane go by. Uh, it would be a Cessna, a very small uh, plane. Uh, not a frequent occurrence, uh, but that would uh, happen. And uh, and as a as a you know a kid, I would be very much uh, interested in that, and I you know and and uh, and I aspire to work in aviation. So certainly uh, joining the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force uh, was uh, was a natural uh, thing for me to uh, to pursue uh, because it allowed me to access uh, uh, you know a career in aviation. Uh, and it allowed me to access multiple different platforms uh, in the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force, so the diversity of platforms. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, so that has been a passion and uh, it's kind of a, a dream fulfilled. Uh, and doing so while serving our country, which is, uh, which I think is, you know, a remarkable uh, opportunity and, uh, and I take it as a, as a privilege to serve. And so people said, hey, work for the government. It's a five-day job, you know, 8.50 to 4.30. It's great. And that's how I started. It was a summer job and I was going to look at something else, you know, but I have a degree in education from University of Toronto. And so that kind of gets your foot in the door. And uh, I had amazing mentors. And that's a, the that's a thing about any workplace. Make sure that you have some really good mentors who support you because I had amazing opportunities. And so I uh, you know, became um, a director, an executive director really, really quickly uh, because of the support I had. And you know, you have to prove yourself. And I took on a lot of challenging roles which were very cross ministry, across ministry. So you were using your, um, not your authority, but your influence in your collaboration and teamwork to get uh, initiatives completed. So then, then you commanded respect. And, and that goes a long way in government. People know about you then. And then they want you to run bigger projects. Uh, so 
my my you know my deputy minister said i my adm at that time said i want you to stay and look at those bigger projects we have which was uh pension policy insurance i had no idea about insurance and also uh financial institutions atb which is a uh, alberta bank we govern it we regulate it so i learned a lot and so it was all about regulations and policies and i fell in love with doing policies you know when uber first came into um into alberta they came in saying you know we digital so everything is fine we don't need to have be insured and that's when i realized that albertans are not safe getting into that uber car because they're not insured something happens they will not uh, have insurance to cover any liabilities that they will face so i was the first woman superintendent in alberta for treasury board and finance as a regulator i put a stop to it and it was like wow i'm doing something that's going to help people but then we also put a policy in place within 6 months to make sure that uber could operate and provide those services that everybody loved so it was those kind of things that gave me that satisfaction that albertans were actually being i was keeping them safe and i was being something very beneficial for them right and then i uh, you know um status of women is close to my heart and that ministry had opened up 3 years ago when i and and when a position for the assistant deputy minister came up i put my hand up and i said that's the place i want to be in because that is where my passion is that's where i want to help women make sure that they get the opportunities uh racialized women uh, indigenous women vulnerable women uh you know how do we make sure that their their needs are being met there are so many barriers and you know sometimes we come from a place of privilege and we don't see that uh but having come over as a refugee and having seen my parents work really hard it kind of you know put that sense that i needed to do something for 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 women as a commercial litigator in a large firm i dealt a lot with uh businesses uh i did not deal uh, largely with family law matters so i had some experience in that area i did not have a great deal of experience in criminal law um and those areas um but now i'm hearing cases where for example i have to decide you know where is a child going to stay or should a child be apprehended that to me is very important work uh it's work that makes a meaningful impact in in a child's life and and certainly i felt that 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 is something that i i i wanted to do uh and so that's one of the reasons why i made the switch and you know i mentor and coach many many people and um they'll often say i want to work for government i have an ambition to follow in the footsteps that you have um i want to become an assistant deputy minister and i say don't stop there become a deputy minister uh, and and often many of these um are 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 students and what i say to students is that when you're in a program in the university or in college um whether you're in a co-op program or not it you know, there's there's a the, join the government as a student there are various mechanisms to be able to come into the federal government as students we want students because they bring in a fresh of breath air um and and to transition from being a student into a full-time um employee in the government is much easier than if you haven't gone down this 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 path in this process and the second advantage is you know if you're a student and you come in it's a testing ground you can learn is this is is the is public service and life in 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 federal government what i want um and and you know and, and as a student it it'll help you to determine whether it is or it isn't um so it's a good testing ground as well the you know the consideration for the air force really uh when we first came on uh, to canada uh you know that was in 93 1993 and uh You know, it was just looking for opportunities. I didn't know I was going to join the Canadian Armed Forces, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, and uh, I recall my brother uh, Rahim, uh, uh, you know, showing me the advertisement for the Royal Military College, and I started reading the pamphlet, and then uh, that pursued uh, uh, to uh, to look into it a little bit more and look at the types of trades and employment opportunities, and I discovered the. Um, uh, you know the uh, the opportunity to become an aerospace engineer and I started to do a little bit more research uh on that particular uh you know trade and in fact I recall going to the recruiting center uh you know I was so keen uh to uh to become part of uh 
uh, you know, the Royal Canadian Air Force. At the time, it was just the Canadian Air Force. Uh, uh, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, I, I went into the recruiting center and I didn't even have my Canadian citizenship at the time. So I was at about a three year mark. And uh, so, and uh, at the time I was also um, uh, enrolled in, uh, uh, or I was just finishing up high school and uh, was accepted to University of Calgary. So uh, I went into the recruiting center and they say, uh, you know, the, uh, the recruiter, uh, you know, uh, provided the criteria and one of them was, uh, was you could not be a landed immigrant, you had to be a Canadian citizen. Uh, so, uh, so I waited a year. I did uh, a year at uh, University of Calgary, uh, pursuing my uh, other passion. Uh, and, uh, anyways, the uh, what uh, turned out to be um, uh, a year of waiting, really, uh, and uh, then finally getting accepted to the Royal Military College. So I was able to do my um, my degree uh, at the uh, at the college and uh, fit after finishing uh, you know uh, and all the summers uh, were filled with uh, tr- uh, getting experience in different types of platforms uh, which uh, was fascinating and it's all about giving and you learn though and I, i'll tell you being on those on those boards actually helped me to move up in my my career at work it, it i feel that if i hadn't done if I hadn't had those opportunities um, and, and got those competences of presenting at boards, um, looking at evidence-based data to, to make sure that our policies were were being uh, you know were accurate uh, or hitting the mark, and looking at diversity and inclusion, even within Ismailis, there's there's a lot of diversity, and we need we need to look at inclusion, and kind of falls in with the work that I'm doing as well. So I always tell. You know, um, people that are at work who are mentoring, who are also working through the careers, to say you need to volunteer. You amazing, amazing competencies you learn through volunteerism, and you learn your ethics. Um, and and you and you know, I live by those ethics where you have to help uh, some of you who is less fortunate than you. And in this case, I have the opportunity not to just help one person, but a whole sector or all the women in Alberta, right? So it's just very satisfying to do that. I came to Canada with my parents. My father is a doctor in Ontario. My mother was his nurse uh, for almost 50 years. I have a sister who's a doctor. Uh, I had an interest in government early. I started even in, uh, in high school as sort of the class prime minister. And then I got a job uh, working in Ottawa. Uh, and I learned about government uh, through that while I went through undergrad and law school. Um, and so that interest has always been there. Uh, that belief that we should get involved in our community and help out has also always been there and was instilled sort of uh, in me at an early age. You know, life in service uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces is certainly a team effort, uh, you know, and it's a family affair. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, my wife, Amy, and uh, our uh, young, uh, uh, almost uh, nine-month-old uh, uh, daughter Anaya uh, have sacrificed a lot already. Uh, you know, being together and moving uh, on multiple uh, uh, occasions, and uh, and certainly uh, being away from family uh, for long periods of time. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, my mom and dad, and uh, uh, my uh, sisters and my brother. Uh, you know, very uh, don't see them very often, uh, and, uh, and certainly that uh, sacrifice uh, of uh, not being uh, uh, in close proximity and uh, being away from family on uh, on occasion uh, really uh, uh, is is a testament to the strength of uh, of service and uh, and recognizing the sacrifices that are involved, not just for from me personally, but for the broader family. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, that that is talked about. You know, uh, when you do serve in the Canadian Armed Forces, it's uh, truly a team effort and a family affair. Uh, and uh, I certainly want to thank uh, all those that uh, surround me uh, to continue to serve. Uh, it wouldn't be possible uh, without uh, their uh, personal sacrifice. So. Ethics are ingrained in you. You grow up with, you know, our Ismaili ethics. Do good, 
respect others, you know, help others who are less fortunate than you. Um, all those things are ingrained in you. You don't lie. You mean, you know, be transparent, be, you know, collaborative. All those things are part of our, our fabric. And I think that's why I adjusted or adapted so well to government because you need all those skill sets or you need those ethics and values to be able to move in government because you're not a you're not an activist. Uh, you know, if you're an activist, this wouldn't work for you because things don't happen fast. It, it needs to be like you know, so not no Nesca face solutions. They have to be very thought out, sustainable, uh, making sure nobody's left behind. So it's. It's the way I was brought up. You know, I have been involved in, in local councils, in national councils. I was the president for the Council for Ottawa for a number of years. Um, I have had the privileges, privilege to um, to listen to some of the guidance and to, and to deeply understand the guidance. And so when you're in federal government, regardless of which department you're in, in, in you're in, having that backdrop and having that uh, um, that understanding of some of the issues and some of the um, some of the um, areas of concern for the Jamaat as as a whole and for the community um, outside of the Jamaat as a whole um, is is so 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 powerful. And you take the seat at the table, um, and 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 you bring all of these experiences with you to the table, um, and 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 you use them to ensure that you are able to influence the policy making or the decision making for the benefit of the community at large. So it played a very, very huge role for me. I find the uh, aspects of service uh, are very much ingrained uh, within the Canadian uh, Armed Forces uh, and particularly, uh, you know, uh, reiterating the time uh, that we spent in the Sudan and some of the incredible work that, uh, that happened that was incredibly enriching, but also I believe aligned with uh, with uh, our practices in in, uh, in our faith, right? Uh, trying to to help uh, in where we can and serve uh, those communities. Uh, you know, I recall when because we were the first observers going in there after a 40-year civil war, right? So it was a ravaged uh, country at the time, and there was some significant infrastructure challenges and uh, some challenges with uh, just access uh, to water, uh, having uh, roadways uh, and uh, medical access, obviously. Uh, you know, those challenges and being able to impactfully uh, provide those surveys. So one of the roles was to help uh, uh, the arms of the development network uh, within the United Nations and uh, other, uh, other NGOs in the area to help them uh, access some of those uh, communities, but also to understand what the needs of those communities were. Uh, there is a misconception about government workers out there that they don't really work that hard, and that's not true. Uh, majority of the time, government, uh, work, government staff are working very hard to get policies developed and uh, for the betterment of Albertans or Canadians or whichever province they happen to be. And it's an amazing opportunity to be in, to be able to do that, because you're actually making an impact, not just on my life, but everybody around me and in the whole province and making sure no one is being left behind. What our role is in the system is to be the impartial arbiter, to decide cases as they come before us without regard to where you come from, in terms of whether you're government or whether you're a corporation or whether you're an individual. Um, you come to our courtroom, you get an equal footing. Uh, and, and that's important uh, because, of course, not everybody uh, will have the same resources when they come to court, um, which is why, for example, in the criminal context, the standard for conviction is so high uh, because we recognize that. Uh, and then the role of the judge is to decide those cases. And sometimes that means even making decisions that will upset the people that appointed us. Uh, but that's our job. It is our job to listen to those cases, determine the facts and apply the law to those facts. I'm hoping, especially in this portfolio that I have, which is status of women and multiculturalism, is to be able to come up with some policies and strategies that will be sustainable and, and help us through this very difficult phase we're going through. 
where there's so much racism? How do we work together, um, you know, and how do we collaborate better? And how do we use a diversity and inclusion lens everywhere, not just little pieces, but in every policy that we create? So we work very hard as status of women to educate other ministries and their staff on when they're making policy or developing policy to bring that, that lens of diversity and inclusion um, and gender analysis to everything that they're doing so that no one gets left behind. I believe that my role with the Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada is going to have a huge impact um, because, um, you know, if you look at the trajectory of the number of of um, uh, immigrants that we're letting into the country, we're bringing into the country, it's been growing. It's been growing quite, quite a bit and I don't think it's going to stop. And so to be able to improve the processes, to be able to make it easier, to be able to take a client view of it on what it can we do to make it easier for um, clients to be able to apply, to shorten the timeframes from application to decision to folks landing from two and three and four years to two and three months um, is going to be, I think, significant for people who are in other parts of the world who, for whom the day-to-day -day, um, survival is, 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 is difficult. And, and, and if a decision is made faster on their files and they're able to leave um, the situation that they're in and come to Canada to safety, that's people's lives that are impacted, that's one. The second is um, when they arrive in Canada, um, where you know the, the 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 work that we we do from an from an immigration refugees and citizenship Canada perspective is we work with service provider organizations like United Way and uh, and, and and other immigration um, uh, uh, organizations and how can we make it better for folks so that they can get to learn the language they can get you know to a point where they become self-sustaining quite quickly and quite fast. Uh, I must admit, I don't think about it in terms of, you know, what am I going to be thought of centuries from now? Am I going to be a Lord Denning who is often quoted or not? Um, I really think about it in terms of the individual person that comes before the courtroom. That person, to them on that day, their case is the most important case. And I want to try and hear them, what they have to say, what their concerns are, determine those facts and arrive at, uh, at a just result that applies a lot to those facts. Um, and so I view my impact as one case at a time. Each case that comes before me is important and is deserving of that attention and that, that level of analysis. It is a question I reflect on a lot. What impact uh, will my service have uh, on the country and on the Canadian Armed Forces? Uh, you know, I look at that much more now uh, as uh, I'm in 23 years of service uh, than I did uh, when I first started. Is what impact and what legacy uh, do I want to leave? When I first started uh, as a as a, in, a first line engineering officer in 407 Squadron in Comox, you know, right away it was uh, it was uh, evident what the impact was. We were doing these drift net uh, fishery patrols as part of the U United Nations uh, moratorium, Operation Driftnet, against uh, driftnet fisheries, which are quite damaging uh, to the environment. And uh, I felt that um, the aspect of, uh, of uh, the role that we had as a maintenance officer supporting uh, the surveillance asset that would deploy to some of these locations would, uh, uh, would have a, uh, an impact on uh, enforcing that moratorium or uh, you know the anti-piracy missions uh, that uh, the, that uh, the aircraft was part of, uh, and so there are many roles that this aircraft plays, and uh, and other platforms as well. Um, you know, people people um, tend to say that uh, you know if I get I, I I only have a little bit of time to serve in the community, and that's okay. But serve, serve in the community, whether it's with the Jamaat, whether it's with Jamaati institutions, whether it's outside of the Jamaat with organizations such as United Way or others, serve. The reason I say that is simply because not only is it, do, you, do you get the skill sets and the knowledge, but you build your networking. 
people will get to see you people will get to know you and 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 you also tend to understand you know all of the empathetic things that i i use right now at my work in in the in improving um you know the the the, the way people are treated the um the the you know the leadership aspects of things it, it, it's 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 i didn't learn that at work i learned that with my community service i learned that when i met with you know i was a member for settlement and so when when the first refugees from afghanistan came i saw firsthand what their needs were what they went through the you know the 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 um the the, the, the how scared they were but how how happy they were at the same time so i would say to to folks um you know get involved because when you do that work and you jump into the public service it it it's it, it transitions itself extremely well once you're in the public service then be committed to the service of public that's what we do that's what public servants are it's to make lives lives of our citizens better um and 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 to protect their health and safety take that mandate because as is smiley's we can give a lot and the values and the ethics and the morals that we bring are ones that people will learn from us by watching us and i think that's important what truly remarkable stories it is amazing to see so many smileys reaching pinnacle roles and being able to contribute to our home in such unique and truly inspiring ways as i reflect on canada day i do think about the day i became a canadian citizen at the tender age of 6 years old where my dad took me out of school and then had to sign my papers on my behalf because my penmanship wasn't up to scratch i know this is an experience for many members of the jamaat whether they came to canada from uganda from other parts of east africa afghanistan tajikistan syria india pakistan or the multitude of other countries where our diverse jamaat originates from as a member of parliament i've also had the privilege to host many canadian citizenship ceremonies including some right here in my riding of parkdale high park here in toronto on canada day itself i can say in complete honesty and sincerity that this is one of the highlights of my work as a parliamentarian to see the joy the hope and gratitude of newcomers who have made the active choice to call canada their new home but what i say to each of them at each ceremony is what i will say to all of you now canada is a great nation a nation of ordinary people doing extraordinary things because canadians believe in helping each other in paying it forward and it is incumbent upon us to keep doing so i think never more so than during this pandemic have we seen this canadian ethic of giving back shine through with canadians working hard to support their neighbors their seniors those in their community in need i thank everyone in the jamaat for being so steadfast in this commitment this seva over the past 15 months this generosity of spirit is truly something that defines canada and its citizens let's turn now to take a moment to reflect on these citizenship ceremonies and their significance I swear. I swear that I will be faithful. That I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada, including the Constitution, which, which recognizes, recognizes and affirms the Aboriginal and treaty rights, rights of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. As a Canadian citizen. As a Canadian citizen. Thank you so much. Those reflections on citizenship were 
extremely powerful. Before we go, July 5th marks the beginning of the annual Focus Star campaign. This year's theme is Be Ready for Anything, Even the Future. With the world still grappling with the impacts of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic and with continued conflict, natural disasters and refugee crises affecting so many of our Ismaili brothers and sisters around the world on a daily basis, I think the work of FOCUS has become even more critical. Here at home, FOCUS also makes possible many of the programs and many of the resources available through the Future Ready Initiative, including supports for things like mental health, job skill development, youth mentorship, and family mentorship. As a refugee myself, like so many of those watching, I know how critical so many of these supports can be to improving one's quality of life and that of one's family, and I hope you'll be able to support that very essential work. You can find out more information at iicanada.org. We will now end as we always do with musical expressions. I had a very wonderful time hosting this evening's events, and I hope that each of you stays safe, stays healthy, and has a wonderful week. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Awakening is under